Hey, good morning. I am, uh, I'm excited that you're here. If you're new, welcome to church. This, uh, this may not be the kind of church you're used to, and that's just fine. We'll, uh, we'll take you. You can take us. It's all going to work out. Uh, my name's Danny. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we're in a series right now called GASP, and it's, it's been challenging. Uh, I get, I'm getting lots of emails, lots of encouragement, some people who just are frustrated with me, and I'm, I'm loving every second of it. <laughs> Uh, so uh, th- let me show you kind of the, 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 the past few weeks what it looks like. Here's our graph that we've been walking through. So we've been moving from life-changing awareness of God, discipleship, the active life. And last week we hit the wall and we're talking about how every one of these, ultimately in your process of spiritual transformation or development, you really move from place to place through inspiration. That's the idea of the series. It's this uh, concept, and I'll, I'll read it. It's a teaching series about looking into and questioning the role inspiration plays within each of our lives. And so this is what the series is about. So as we move to this, last week we hit the wall. And uh, oh, what a wall it was. I had so much feedback, maybe more feedback than I've had in, in any other talk within the last year or so. Uh, it, it, a lot of people related to this sort of uh, circular, uh, repetitive spiritual journey. They, they get inspired and they're like, God is real and I want to follow him. And so they join a church or a small group. They start serving and helping. And then they hit some sort of tragedy or struggle or concern that they just can't mentally, emotionally, spiritually push back. So they move away. They say, obviously, God's not real. Church isn't for me. People in church are terrible. And the experience is terrible. Or I'm not worthy. Or whatever it is. It can be outside, inside, whatever. And then they, they, they know because God is, God is efficient, right? And he is assertive and he is aggressive. He stays with you. He doesn't force himself, but he doesn't leave just because you're frustrated. And so God finds you in your coffee shop, in your conversations, through a video on Facebook. Somebody shares a sermon or promises to take you to church and buy you lunch. So you're like, fine. You go. You suddenly become aware. You're like, oh man, God's real. I, I need more God in my life. I need more center. I, I need more for my kids. I, I want a legacy beyond myself. And then you start to disciple, then you get involved and serve, and then once again you find yourself at the wall. But last week I had handshake after handshake after handshake. Right before I walked on stage, a gentleman asked me and said, I made it through. And, and, I, said, and I looked at him, I said, what does that mean? And he just started doing this on his face. Just made tears on his face. He made it through. A part of him made it through. Now here's some clarity I want to bring before I pray and we actually start the sermon. Not your whole being oftentimes will make it through the wall. There still may be things you've not dealt with. That does not mean, as we talk about journey inward, that you can't learn about this and that you won't recognize certain parts of your story that have made it through the wall. You need to give yourself some grace and give yourself some some space to sit on the other side of the wall. Don't pretend you've made it just because you're like, everybody else is over there and I want to be on the team too. Leave the parts of you that that haven't made it through the wall and walk through the parts of you that have to this this concept we're going to talk about today, journey inward. I'll say right now, there's parts of my story that have not made it through the wall. They're just not. But because a piece of me has, I know that I can can do this. I know that God is giving me this privilege of, of being in authentic relationship with him and other people. And so today as we talk about this journey inward and the power that inspiration has, I want you to know, you may have a tendency today to feel bad that you're not further along. And that's, that's something we're going to talk about. That's a feeling called shame that is adequate in some circumstances, but I'm telling you today it's inappropriate. You do not need to feel shame because you haven't made it through the wall. You may just be awakening today. You don't even know about the spiritual stuff. You just showed up. We joke around here because a pretty girl asked you. Bummer for you. Right? You, I don't know. We, but wherever you're at in your process, be in your process. It doesn't mean you can't learn about these other steps. It doesn't mean part of you might be in those other steps. Or you might suddenly realize people in your life are in those steps. And they've been ministering to you and caring for you all along. Either way, as we talk about journey and inward, don't give yourself the excuse that it doesn't apply to you because you're still stuck on the other side of the wall. And don't think, I've passed through the wall. I'm good to go. No more walls for me. Because that's not true. And that could be your wall, that you thought you were fine, and then all of a sudden somebody in church disappoints you, and you're like, I guess those people aren't fake. They are hypocrites just like I thought. That's a portion of your wall that you've got to walk through, because I'm here to tell you, everybody in this room is a little bit fake, and everybody in this room is a little bit hypocrite. 
And that includes you judging me while I judge you. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's, just soak it in for a minute. Uh, so let me pray, and then we're going to dive into this, uh, this journey inward. Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful for the way that you use us, for the way that you, uh, that you talk with us, for the way that you challenge us and discipline us and allow us sometimes to sit in conflict or difficulty, for the way that you bring peace and purpose, and for the way that you, you make us, God, inspired to, to be the people you already know we're supposed to be. May we not feel inferior today. May we not feel like we're not far enough along. May we not feel like we've arrived and that somehow we are just here to help other people get to where we are. May we instead, Lord, just be as we are, both and, also, more, less than. All these things that allow us to feel your presence and feel the need for more of your presence all at the same time. We are grateful, and we're now uh, ready, God, to hear what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So, journey inward. I'll start off with the obvious. Like many Christians today, I was taught that feelings, just about all of them, are unreliable and not to be trusted. They go up and down and are the last thing we should be attending to in our spiritual lives, especially as a supposed spiritual leader. I need to make sure and base everything I do on, uh, on the Bible. I need to make sure I base everything I do on good counsel. And if I got a feeling that it's, it's this, that, that's just probably something in my heart, something that, that I'm dealing with that I need to, uh, to, to just wrestle through in order to find the truth of God's purpose in my world. And yet there are hundreds of emotions with all sorts of variations, blends, and hundreds of particular nuances, which are hard to turn off. Uh, researchers, psychologists have broken all of our emotions really into eight main families. The first one is anger. This is the idea of fury, hostility, irritability, and annoyance. The next one is sadness. This is grief, self-pity, despair, dejection, and loneliness. The next one is fear. This is anxiety, edginess, nervousness, fright, terror, apprehension. The next one's enjoyment. This is joy, relief, contentment, delight, thrill, euphoria, ecstasy. The one that's most obvious and I think most often understood is love. It's acceptance, trust, devotion, and adoration. Then we have surprise, shock, amazement, and wonder. We have disgust, which looks like contempt, scorn, aversion, distaste, and revulsion. And the last one is shame, which is guilt, remorse, humiliation, embarrassment, and a word I've never heard anyone use, chagrin. Which I think is a word we should use more often. Like, how you doing? Oh, I'm feeling kind of chagrined. Is that how you would use it maybe? Or, I don't know. I have never used it, but I'm going to. I'm going to slip it into a sermon in the future. And I'm just going to talk about how chagrined I was. Or how chagrined my wife should have been. That's probably what I should. Something like that. These emotions, though, right, these emotions right here obviously are just kind of core things that branch into other stuff. These emotions all carry with them all sorts of different baggage that each of you in the room has experienced differently. Some of you have experienced really healthy anger. It doesn't bother you at all. You think about angry and you're like, yeah, it's good. It's, it's, it's healthy. To... And then some of you in the room, the word anger shouldn't even be up here because it's, it should be disallowed as an emotion that people deal with because it's caused so much damage to you and the people you love. Sadness, if you're a person that needs to be strong, you're kind of a cornerstone figure of your family, you don't want to feel sadness. You need to help. You need to serve. Other people have time to feel sadness, but not me. Fear, unproductive. These are things I've actually been told in sessions with people. Fear's not productive. It doesn't do anything. Unless a bear's chasing me, I got no time to be afraid. <laughs> Enjoyment, who has time for that till they retire? Right? I got too much to do, too much on my plate to enjoy. Love, it's a dangerous thing. <laughs> yeah. I got other lyrics, but I'm just going to leave that one for you right now. <laughs> Love is, is it, it, right, it's, it, it causes you to be vulnerable, to be exposed, uh, but it's also something that we desire so much to, to have from the people in our lives. Surprise uh, can be good, and it can be really, really bad. 
And, and it's, one of the, it's a great emotion that, that I think most people have a, probably a fairly good handle on. Like, it's fun to be surprised with good things, and it's not fun to be surprised with bad things. Not a ton of people hate surprise, uh, but it is, it, is, uh, it is one of those things that uh, if you've been surprised too many times the wrong way, then from now on, just tell me everything in advance. Yeah, okay, I got to those people. Uh, disgust? This one's pretty obvious, especially when it comes to the way we view the world, to the way we view maybe politics, to the way we view how churches operate or how people operate. We, we often like to use this word that it just sort of is this core feeling of revulsion. And then, of course, shame, which is a feeling that a lot of times, once it gets on you, like a really bad stain to the soul, you just cannot get off. It, and and I, that's why I said earlier, shame's not supposed to work that way. Shame has a purpose, but it's, it's not supposed to last as long as oftentimes I discover that it lasts. Because of all these different uh, categories and because all the different ways these things can be experienced, most Christians do not think they have permission to consider their feelings, to name them or express them openly because of the way in which those feelings have been used to hurt them. This especially applies, by the way, to the more difficult feelings of things like fear, sadness, shame, like I said, anger. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But here's the thing that I'm going to launch off of that I, I don't need you to agree with or disagree with. I just need you to feel. I just need you to feel. So in this talk, there's going to be a, a couple different times when you disagree with me. If you disagree passionately, we're in, right? Because we're feeling. But if you disagree like this, it doesn't matter, then you have shut out and I'm going to call you a coward publicly from stage. <laughs> okay, you're not actually fighting anymore. You basically stepped outside the ring and you're like, I don't got to fight because I'm so tough. And I'm scared to death, right? I mean, those are, so here's the thing. You can disagree. You can disagree. I'm not, I'm not here to convince you that I'm right, even though clearly I am right. But, <laughs> but <laughs> clearly. But, but I don't need you to understand that. I just need you to feel. That's what we're here to do today. We're just here to feel. So here's where I'm going to launch out of. Feelings are an important part of how God, ready, communicates to us. Now, I lost about 20% of you, but if you don't want to be a coward, you got to stay in the ring and just sort of circle around because you're like, oh, hold on, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, all these things. That's how God talks to us. Feelings are, hold on, tell me more. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Feelings are an important part of how God communicates to us. And for many of you, this is a brand new concept. It has never entered your mind that God might be speaking to you through your feelings. And so... Some of you in this room have lived much of your life believing that feelings are a less than adequate way to hear from God, as if your emotions are some kind of compromised truth because they're yours. Now, I've got a whole lot to say about truth, okay? But here's the thing I want you to understand. I, people love to find their truth, okay? People love to use that phrase. I believe, based on the Bible and the way the world works, that the truth you find is a truth that already existed. I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that. I preach that. And I believe what people are really saying when they find their truth is that they finally got in touch with their emotions and owned them. This is what I believe people are trying to say. Like, I found my truth. Because you got in touch with your emotions. You got in touch with the fact you've been angry for 20 years. Just because you don't say anything or hit anybody doesn't mean you don't rage. And so finally, when you can accept that, this is the, what happens when you get on the other side of the wall. You realize when you come on the other side of the wall that you didn't bring any of those old tools with you. You didn't bring, hopefully, the addictions, the stuff. You want to go back and get them, but if you're honest with yourself and your spiritual process, your personal development, if you're honest, you recognize you kind of come through the wall naked and exposed. And then you accept, I'm kind of angry. I'm kind of frustrated. I, I think I have a lot of shame. All the stuff that covered you as you went through this process have, through inspiration, been torn off you. So you stand authentically before God and all the things he's telling you, oftentimes through your emotions. You've asked, like I have, how could I listen to my desires, dreams, likes, and dislikes? Wouldn't they potentially take me the way of rebellion, away from God? You've done it. I've done it. As a matter of fact, this little portion, this little cul-de-sac within the message, is probably for people who have spent a lot of time in church and who consider themselves fairly spiritually developed. Because another key part of being spiritually developed is, and I quote, not being too emotional, making decisions based on the Bible. 
making decisions based on sound teaching, making decisions based on sound counsel. Can't let yourself get too emotional. So in a, in a very similar way, Jesus is right when he says children are the faith we're supposed to have. Those of you new to the faith or those of you here searching authentically, you might actually be a better example of someone who's journeying inward than someone who's been a Christian for 25 years because you've spent all this time, like I did, honing your robotic skills. This is why churches are shrinking, most of them. It's because people come in frustrated and angry. They come here for a purpose. They come in to find answers to the stuff they're dealing with. And when the answers they find are cold faces, they go, oh, I can tell you how to turn that off. They go, what? Like, so this stuff is, yeah, you just got to give it all to Jesus. You got to nail it to a cross and lay it at the foot of, of Jesus. You just got to walk away from those things. You got to throw those things away. And so they either leave and go back to their community that supports their feelings, or they learn to be like us. And the cycle continues, and the unhealth continues. And then we raise kids that we tell to stop crying or to be quiet or to behave in a certain way, not because we know they shouldn't, but because they, they embarrass us and they kind of mess with the mask we've put on to everyone else that we have our life together. And yet these feelings are an important part of how God communicates us, which means if you're reading ahead, you're missing a whole bunch of what God's trying to say in your life. This, uh, this is difficult. This is complicated. Because as we live denying these parts of ourselves, we eventually live in such a way that year after year we lose our ability to be emotional. And so eventually we become kind of less human. We transform slowly into empty shells with smiling faces painted on them. I'm sad to say that this is the sour fruit of many of our churches and the discipleship that we teach. Because in a very real way, the failure to appreciate the biblical place of feelings within our larger Christian lives has done extensive da damage, keeping free people in Christ in slavery. We talked a lot about it. Church isn't a perfect institution. It's led by a perfect God, but as soon as we all entered the door, it became something else. And so we have to own that. It's the only way that we can experience what we're supposed to. And if that means that we recognize that we are, are part of the problem, which we clearly are, then, then that's the only way to fix it. Do you know the best thing you can do for your kids? Tell them in an appropriate time you don't know. I can't, I can't believe how many rooms I sit in with teenagers on their way to adults who suddenly realize they didn't know all the answers, but because they were raised by a parent who always pretended they knew all the answers out of love, out of protection, out of support, out of structure, out of really responding to a parent who was out of control in their life, a, right, a grandparent or something. This kid comes to me and sits with me, scared to death, privately says, this is all confidential, right? And I go, yeah. And he's like, yeah, I don't know what to do next. And I'm like, yeah, welcome to 21. And he's like, what? Like, what do you mean? I'm like, nobody knows what to do at 21. I mean, not, I mean that's the problem with 21-year-olds. They pretend they know everything, and then they... They, they, they make decisions based on that knowledge, and that's why 31, you look back and go, ugh. And then 41, you go, oh, my goodness. Right? And you just progress. And I can't believe how many people don't know their parents don't know. And then, they, and then you know what happens? This is a different talk, but they kind of start not trusting because what else did dad not tell me? What else did mom not tell me? It's important for us to feel and experience the things in our life because this is the kind of the, the corner that we turn. The journey of genuine transformation begins with a commitment to allow yourself to feel. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It means you stop doing the fishing skills and you start doing the feeling skills. It means you stop being a text collector and you start feeling. These are things that people did with their hands and Jesus is like, yeah, that's all important, but now I'm gonna teach you to fish for people. And the fishing done with people is through hearts. And if you're not willing to transform and love people that everyone else can't connect with, then what, what kind of fisherman are you? You may notice in and out of our service that we have special needs people that come in and sit with us all the time. They make noises during the service. Just so you know, I'm not distracted. It doesn't bother me. I can do my job. It's fine. I recognize for you it might be a little bit. 
the end of the service, just this last service, I was praying, and at a really poignant point, I said something like, God wants to do this and this and this and this in your life, and it was quiet, and the lady in the back row said, not mine. <laughs> That's fine. I moved on, right? People smiled, and we move on. If we're not going to be a congregation that, that includes things that distract us, that includes things that are, that, are, that are more than, if we're not willing to be transformative in our story and in our time together, then what are we doing here? It's just, it, we're missing the entire point. So, let's get into that. Scripture, first off, reveals a God as an emotional being who feels. Let me give you a couple verses. The first one is kind of a punch in the face, so I apologize, but here it is. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. <laughs> if you don't think God's emotional, then you need to talk to the writer of that verse and have that one stricken because God's like, what have I done? He's a basic parent at this point, like we all have experienced, right? Where you're like, is this because of me? Like, did I do this? Like, why would she think that? And this is just a, but this is a beautiful idea of regret and his heart is troubled. These are emotions. <laughs> Here's some other ones. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I'm a jealous God. That means he wants you all for himself because he knows he's the best there is for you. How about Isaiah 42? For a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp, and pant. This is the idea, and I think this bothers some people, but let's just get over ourselves. Like, God's not a man, okay? And so he relates to, to both men and women because they're both created in his image. And God can relate to all of the aspects of what it means to be human. And so God basically says at one point, he's so exasperated, it's like giving birth. And all the women on earth went, mm-hmm. Right? And, and if you're a woman hearing this verse, you're like, that's right. If you're a man, you're like, whoa, God, whoa, whoa, I didn't, whatever you want, I'm happy. To, I just want to make sure you're happy. Okay? It's a powerful verse. How about Jeremiah, the fierce anger of the Lord? Fierce, by the way, for those of you who avoid anger at all costs. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. He is relentless in the pursuit of loving you in spite of you. How about Jeremiah 31? I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with kindness. This word kindness actually is, is the word chesed. It's a Hebrew word, and it's where we get the name of our church, chesed. God says, I have drawn you with kindness. It's powerful. How about Hosea? How can I hand over Israel? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. Matthew 26, Jesus says, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed and sorrow to the point of death. Mark 3, he looked around them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And then the last one's in Luke. At that time, Jesus, it describes something he did as he was full of joy through the Holy Spirit. We serve a God who is emotional. So when people tell you the epitome of being a good Christian is to be less emotional, what they're actually telling you is the epitome of being a Christian is to be less like Christ. Because he was emotional. He felt all these things. He experienced all these things. You want to transform? Start by expressing. Start by naming your feelings. Scripture also reveals that we are made in God's image. I said that earlier. God thinks you think. God wills, you will. God feels, you feel. As a human being made in God's likeness, it is your job to accept that part of that likeness is to feel. At the very least, this is my favorite quote of the sermon, I think. At the very least, the call of discipleship includes experiencing our feelings, reflecting on our feelings, and then thoughtfully responding to our feelings under the lordship of Jesus. There's not a person in this room, if you consider yourself a Christian, who can argue with this ankle-deep level of emotional accountability. You can't. At the very least, even if all the other stuff I'm saying is garbage, at the very least, the call to discipleship includes experiencing your feelings, not pretending they're not real, then reflecting on those feelings that you know are real, and then thoughtfully responding to those feelings under the lordship of Jesus Christ, who is over all and the end of all. It's, 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 you, you, this is, this is the kid's side of the pool theology, okay? 
Like you can put your floaties on and you can float around and pretend like you're doing powerful stuff. But the truth is, until you can actually impact people in your life with this idea and this concept, then you will miss all of the opportunities to sit with people as they are because the whole time you'll be sitting with them, you'll be trying to figure out how to get them as you are. And that's not what Jesus was asking us to do. He wants to get people to be, sit with them and get them to be as he is. And I'm supposed to be there sitting with them, getting them to be as he is as well. And if I act like they need to be like me, then basically what I'm saying is I'm as much like Jesus as Jesus. So feel what I feel, see what I see, do what I do, and act like I act. And that's, that is horrible because you can't maintain it. And so you fall and you crack or you slip or you stay a, a, something you shouldn't. And then the people look at you like, oh, whoa, whoa, I thought I was, all my hope and trust was in Danny or Kesset or my discipleship leader or my teacher or my mentor when all your hope and trust is supposed to be in Jesus. It's, it's, it's just how it works. This is why what we're doing is so important. This is important because so much of our true selves is buried alive within our emotions. Back to the idea that people are trying to discover their truth. What they're discovering is the value of their emotions, and so they decide, I'm going to be a gardener even though everyone around me says it's silly. I'm going to sing. I'm going to act. I'm going to believe this way. I'm going to stand this way. It, it doesn't matter what they believe. It doesn't matter how they even behave to some point because the thing that they're responding to is that they are one with their emotions, and there is no longer that duplicitness within them tearing them apart, and that peace... Again, I'm not telling you to accept all things and all behavior and everything in the margins. I'm telling you to honor that peace in yourself, that you have emotions that are built within you that, you that I have not been able to really rest within. And when I can rest within, then I can walk into any situation and love someone else, and the only agenda I have is to love them into the honest evaluation of their life and their own emotions. And it's, it's powerful when it happens. It's, it's, actually, it's actually, it can be a little bit addicting. Because when you watch someone spin, who suddenly clicks and goes, oh, like their shoulders drop, the tenseness leaves. All the answers and questions are still all out there. They don't know. But what they know is they are them. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. We know this. We know it physiologically. As we look at how God designed our bodies to respond to those in the world around us. God speaks to us through things like a knot in the stomach, a knotted stomach. He speaks to us through muscle tension, trembling and shaking, the release of adrenaline into our bloodstreams, headaches, a suddenly elevated heart rate. God speaks to you through these kinds of things that he's built in you that are you're responding to things happening around you. In other words, soak this in for a minute. You feel even if you are unaware of it. Even if you're aware of it, your body's feeling. It's just you that's disconnected the plug. Your body's experiencing it. That's why your mouth goes dry. That's why you put your hands behind your back. That's why you, you ring them. That's why you look around and dart your eyes. That's why, that's why, that's why. I don't know, but your body is responding to your feelings. And when you don't understand that, then you end up in a place that is in, uh, in war with itself. Because it's how you've been made. The problem is that we can't reflect and respond thoughtfully, okay, that, that, that uh, kiddie pool level theology, we can't respond and reflect thoughtfully to how we're feeling if we don't know what we're feeling and have an ability to name it the whole time. God may be screaming at you through your physical body to do this, to not do that the whole time, but you're out there looking for some sort of churchy spiritual answer. The whole time, like you're, you're in here right now and God's doing stuff with your body and your brain's like, I don't know. Yeah, even your hmm is your body's responding to the fact that, that this is happening to you. As much as you're listening and deciding what to, what to take, this is happening to you. This life is happening to us and our bodies are experiencing it. And then we're over here somehow disconnected, like watching our bodies going, I don't think that's right, and that's definitely not right, and oh, I should choose this. And we're not connecting with the way in which God has built us. 
It's in this way often our bodies know our feelings before our minds. This isn't, by the way, Wicca or some kind of new age psychology. Don't write me off. This is like you sweat before a serious situation. You, you, know, what, you know this about you, right? You know this. Because the way that the Bible has told us that we're built. The real problem for many of us comes when, as I said, we have those difficult feelings. Such as anger or sadness, those things like shame that we can't get rid of. We somehow have a rule against those feelings. We feel defective because we ought not to be feeling those wrong things. We then lie to ourselves, sometimes convincing ourselves that we aren't feeling anything because we don't think we should be feeling those things in the first place. So we shut down our humanity to avoid the mess that comes with being human. Welcome to like 80% of people that you do life with. People who have shut down their humanity because they don't like the mess that comes with being human. And then Jesus shows up and he's born like in a manger. And then he gets a job, not in the church, as a carpenter. And he sweats and he builds things and he, he hits his fingers with the hammer and he laughs and he cries and he gets exhausted and all he would have to do is, is snap his fingers and everything he wants, everything we're shooting for to not feel would happen. But instead he sits within the feelings and experiences all of them for 30 years before he even tells anybody why he's here. This is the beauty of what he was showing us in his humanness. He was coming to show us what it meant to live. And by the way, it says he never sinned. It says he never was without. So he's feeling all these things, doing mundane work, purposeless work for people in the room who are like, I want to do something worthy. Good, go build a chair. That's what Jesus did. Like literally, for, since he was probably 10 years old till 30, he was building chairs and tables. If you really want to be like Jesus, go build a chair. That, that's what the book says. But what you want is all the other stuff without any of the, 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 the difficulty. And Jesus says, you, don't, you can't have it. You don't get permission. And then you're angry, but you won't even admit it. <laughs> because you don't want anything other than to be in charge and be in control. And that just can't happen. Because when we neglect our most intense emotions, we are false to ourselves and close off an open door through which to know God. And so we become God. And then we become disappointed in ourselves that we can't act and do it perfectly. And then we become shame-filled or even deeper pretenders. Or we, it manifests in some other sort of way, some sort of mania or obsession or, or self-destruction that, that keeps us fueling the facade for everyone around us when the whole time God's like, hey, if you could just stop all that and build a chair, like build a life, just, just be living, be a human, if you could just stop all that and feel what you're feeling, I can talk to you through that stuff. Because you don't have to have any Bible college to feel. You don't have to have any church services to feel. You don't even have to have a, a study or, a, or you don't have to have anything to feel. God has already built you. He's built the way in which he often communicates to you within you. Ignatius of Loyola, he was the founder of the Jesuits. And he spent a lot of time with this idea of how do you balance out the mind and the body? How do you, how do you maintain a balance between our reason or intellect and feelings or heart? How do you actually live in this world and both honor what God's word says and honor how we feel and who we are? He says, the issue is not by any means to blindly follow our feelings, but to acknowledge them as part of the way God communicates to us. So again, he's not saying to just go do everything you feel. The Bible's clear about that. He's saying to acknowledge that they both exist and that God can speak through them. In this way, he is basically echoing John 4.1 when he says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. He recognizes that there are multiple ways to hear from God, and those ways need to be tested. He provided excellent guidelines for sorting out how God speaks to us through the raw material of our emotions. These are his two primary guidelines, and I hope they're helpful for you. They were for me. He said, there's two real deep pathways that our emotions run in, two riverbeds that when we, when we feel something that we flood through. The first one is the place of consolations. And those are those interior movements and feelings that, that bring joy, life, peace, and fruit of the Spirit. They're the things that bring balance and, 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 uh, and presence. They're that, they're that Christmas morning, if you've got a good 
connection with Christmas or birthday or holiday where you're looking around at everything and you're like, this is as it should be. These are those places of consolations. But then he says often there's other places, and these are the places of desolations. That which brings us death, spiritual or emotional death, inner turmoil, disquiet, and spiritual turbulence. This is that idea of being uh, in mania or manic or obsessing over something. This is when you're trying to control these places. He says that these places often exist side by side. This is what we're learning in the Bible. This place of desolation and this place of consolation. Sometimes God is prodding us to a better choice. And he's like, you got to make it. This is where I want you to go. And sometimes within us, it's our fleshly desires prodding us to do something that gives us more control and distance from God. These places live inside all of us. But often, people who don't know God or claim to not know God, they just live in desolation, just meeting their every fleshly desire. And I think we can see from Hollywood and every other story that that just really ends poorly. Then there's religious people who live in nothing but this place, consolations, constantly pretending as if they never have any desolateness within their life whatsoever. And so desolate people are like, well, I can't get there because you don't know what it's like to be here. And religious people are too afraid to admit they know exactly what it's like to be there. They were there this morning. But they don't want anybody else to know because all our friends go picnicking on Sunday evenings and we do it in the places that are beautiful, those places of consolations. And I can't bring this to this. And Jesus is like, yeah, you can. Because this is what the cross does. It bridges this beautiful place. But it requires that we feel them both. It requires that we test them both. For God intends that we mature in learning to recognize how he speaks and guide us through our feelings. So it's awesome. This is just beautiful stuff. And so, so hard to journey in this place. In The Cry of the Soul, a book written by Dan Allender and Trimper Longman, they summarize why the awareness of our feelings is so important. I want to read this over you. This is what they said. They said, ignoring our emotions is turning our back on reality. Listening to our emotions ushers us into reality, and reality is where we meet God. Emotions are the language of the soul. They are the cry that gives the heart a voice. However, we often turn a deaf ear through emotional denial, distortion, or disengagement. We strain out anything disturbing in order to gain tenuous control of our inner world. We are frightened and ashamed of what leaks into our consciousness. And so in neglecting our intense emotions, we are false to ourselves and lose a wonderful opportunity to know God. We forget That change comes through brutal honesty and vulnerability before the Lord. And this is the place you've been dragged to right now. This is the place, whether you know it or not, that this entire message has been leading you to. This vulnerable place of change that can experience both the beautiful discomfort and internal inspiration that comes with feeling something authentically. I think it was 11 or 12 years ago, my wife and I made the decision to leave the United States. We were running from a bunch of stuff we were dealing with, not politically or the mob or anything, but just, you know. <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh, this story is intense. Uh, we were just running from this, this spiritual thing that we just didn't want to deal with. So we, we opened up a map of the world. I've said it before, we picked a country, we went to New Zealand. Uh, I went there ahead of time. I backpacked around. I found a place to live. We sold everything. I came back. And my wife lovingly um, did not in any sense of the word have the same calling I did or probably the same need to run as I did. But she, she went with me, which was nice of her. We had three kids at the time, the same three kids we have now. <laughs> uh, and our youngest, who just turned 16 this week, uh, uh, I was like two or three at the time, something like that. And uh, I remember we got on the long portion of the flight, which is 12 hours and 11, 12 hours and 15, 12 hours and 30 minutes from LA to Auckland. And when we got on the flight, uh, Elena had just she just had it. And on top of Aaron's emotions and everyone's emotions, uh, she started crying. And she cried for the, in, the the first three hours of the flight, the entire the entire time. And this is a nighttime flight, so we had dinner. She cried. We. We, gave, we watched a movie, she cried. She was red-faced, exhausted, sweating, arching her back, doing the whole thing. And uh, eventually, Aaron had to get some sleep, so it was my turn to handle her. 
And so I sat on the edge, and I remember just thinking, God, I don't, this just, did I make a mistake? Is something wrong? What are you trying to, I don't understand what to do. And um, there was this, this older, grandmotherly aged uh, native New Zealand woman, a Maori woman, I was sitting just sort of angled to me, and she was sort of staring at me and smiling, and I didn't feel any judgment from her, so I just smiled, and she kind of shrugged, and, and then another hour went by, and the, they started to turn the lights off, and people started grumbling, and this woman didn't. She just kept kind of smiling, and Lainey kept screaming, not like, <laughs> like screaming for hours to the point she's making herself sick. She started getting to that point she was like nearly heaving, right? And, and Aaron, it, it, we just don't know what to do. And so I, I remember I just sort of held her while she's screaming and she's arching. And then I, I felt this tap on my shoulder. And I opened my eyes and it was that grandmotherly Maori woman who said, and I looked over and Aaron's eyes were closed. <laughs> and I said, it's, it's the absolute fact. I didn't even question it. You would have thought I would have been like, no, I'm her dad. I'm going to keep her safe. I was like, here you go, Grandma Maori woman. <laughs> I was so tired. She took her. And she, was a, she was a heavy set. I mean, she was a beautiful, heavy set grandmother, uh, native Maori woman. And she took her, and she like, she like did this like snuggle thing with all her Maoriness, like just kind of <laughs> like, like tucked Laney in there and held her. And then she, and Lainey's, of course, freaking out. She's looking at her like, what is happening, you know? And she's looking at me, and I was like, that's what happens. See ya, <laughs> right? <laughs> yep, you're with her forever, right? <laughs> but I, I just stared, right, because I was sweating, and Lainey's looking, and she held her, and she said something in her ear in their native language, and then she started humming. And Lainey, like, kind of looks and kind of looked, and she kept shoving her and, and kind of, burying her deeper, right, and, and, and like a grandma can do, right, and, and within six, seven minutes, she was out. She held my daughter for six hours, and that was my welcome to that country. She felt our emotions, and she expressed something to Lainey that obviously we weren't giving, that she saw in our eyes, and Lainey's body and her body responded to that, and she found the comfort that she needed and you know what's so cool is I think she wanted to give it as much as Lainey needed it. And Aaron and I were able to rest, and we were able to talk with her the rest of the flight and tell her our story and share a meal. And I mean, it was a, I never, I, I, I never saw her again. I told Aaron, I think that might be who Jesus greets me at when I get to heaven. Like, get in! And I'll be like, get in here, Jesus. Get in here. I'll climb up in there, right? I don't care. I don't know. I never saw her again. But, but I, I, like, that's a peaceful place, and I want to be there. That's, so... So here, here's where I'm going with this. When I landed in this country, I was greeted by these people who are really in tune with their emotions, the Maori people. And the Maori people do something called the haka. And the haka is a type of ancient Maori war dance traditionally used on the battlefield as well as when groups came together in peace. The haka is a fierce emotional display of a tribe's pride, strength, unity, and pain. They, they expressed it. I got to see it dozens of times in all sorts of different places. I, and, and, and it became something that I, that I was used to, that I enjoyed, because it was this expression of emotion that I, I hadn't really been able to see before. You may have seen, there's a video that has gone viral recently um, of a tragedy in New Zealand, and uh, there's a, uh, a high school boy who they believe committed suicide, and there's a video of his funeral, and at his funeral, his friends decided to do a haka to express what they were feeling. And so I'm going to play this video for you in just a moment. It's not a fancy video. It's on a cell phone. Um, but I'm going to, I, I'm going to ask the, that what you do is not judge it to be something that is so different from our culture, that you don't try to evaluate who, what these people are going through, that you just simply feel something authentically. It's a powerful thing, and it's a scary thing, and it's a vulnerable thing. It would be easy for you just to watch it as if it's just another thing in church, but I'm going to ask that you don't do that, that you journey inward, and that you allow yourself to experience what's happening on the screen. Please watch. <laughs> Hello! 
ringa ett av rånna That's what the journey inward looks like. It looks like expressing what you're going through, not pretending that you're stronger than or smarter than or really anything other than what you are. My hope for you, and I'm going to put these up so you can have them, and they're on the notes. This is my hope for you and your journey inward, that you allow yourself to experience the full weight of your feelings without censoring them. But they're yours. And because they're yours, they're valuable. No matter who's told you not to experience them or that you're wrong, I'm just here to tell you, and I hope spiritually free you, feel. Feel. My hope for you is that once in this vulnerable place, you can reflect and thoughtfully decide what to do with those feelings. That after you've named them, after you've experienced them, you can, with guidance, with prayer, with consult, you can decide what those feelings are and where they go. And lastly, my hope for you is that in the end, you discover that God has been speaking to you through those feelings, desiring to show you more of who he is and how much he loves you. We serve an amazing God. And you know the best part of the journey inward is he's the one already in the center of it all, beckoning at us on, calling us forward. He's the one that wants to meet us. And it's our job to keep at it, to feel, and to trust him with what he wants to do with it. This has been a hard process. But it'll change your marriage, it'll change your life, it'll change your story, because ultimately it will change your heart. And I'm so very honored that you're a church that's willing to do it because the impact you're going to have when people who need love show up with people like that lady with my daughter who can give love is powerfully peaceful. That's who we get to be because that's who God has called us. We're his children. And we get to love people like him. Amen. Amen. Will you stand for closing prayer? Lord, we are honored to feel what we're feeling right now. And I think it would, uh, it would be true to say that, that there are a myriad of feelings in the room. 
Some people are pulling things from the past. Some people are thinking of the future. Some people are in something right now. But God, you are in all those places. You know how to move them, how to inspire them into the person you've already called them to be. Thank you, Lord, that that you are the only one who can do that, who can handle the tenderness of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the way in which you've built us, for the way you've talked to us. Thank you, Lord, for, for giving us so much of you. May we honor that part as we seek out how to continue in transformational love. We lift this week to you now. And all of God's people said, amen.